Tragedy isn't like lightning. Sometimes a family is struck over and over again. One of our goals in this podcast is to try to go beyond the missing pretty white girl victim that the media tends to feature. People of all races, genders, and ethnicities go missing, and they are loved just as much as the ones who get a ton of media coverage. This week's story is about someone who isn't a media-perfect victim, but he is someone who has a family who desperately loves him and is counting down the days until they can get answers and some sense of closure. On March 23, 2010, 23-year-old Shane Donahue left his parents' home in Noakesville, Virginia, and told them that he loved them. It was a completely ordinary day full of completely ordinary activities. Shane, who didn't drive at the time, got a ride with his buddy, Timothy Hickerson. Within 10 minutes, both of Shane's cell phones were dead or off, and Shane was never seen nor heard from again. Over the past decade, there have been many allegations made by both the Donahue and Hickerson families, but little in the way of answers or media coverage. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell the stories of those who never came home. I want to tell you the story of Shane Donahue. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. Shane Ryan Donahue, or Bubba, as his parents called him, was born in Virginia on August 22, 1986, to Brian and Donna Donahue. As the middle of three kids, Shane led a pretty normal life in Noakesville, Virginia. And for those of you who don't know, that makes this the local case for us. Uh, we're only about 45 minutes away from Noakesville, and I work out in that area frequently. In fact, the first house I ever sold was in Noakesville. Just to give you an idea about what this place is like, it's in Northern Virginia, but is relatively rural. There are still a lot of farms out there and dirt roads are certainly not uncommon. The closest city is probably Manassas and that's likely where you would go shopping or find a variety of restaurants. So it's, you know, it's pretty country, but it is still only around 35 miles from Washington, D.C., so it's not completely out in the sticks or anything like that. Shane led an unassuming life that wasn't filled with a lot of direction. In 2010, Shane was 23 and working odd jobs. He lived in a duplex in Noakesville close to his parents' house and just, you know, kind of lived his life day to day. The nice thing about Noakesville is that the cost of living is relatively low compared to other areas in Northern Virginia, so it's a great place to find yourself, especially if you're close with your family who lives there. And that's what Shane was doing. He'd visit his parents, probably get some free meals, like maybe even a little laundry, and then go down the street to his house and do normal 23-year-old things. And honestly, as someone who's approaching 40, trying to build a business, and has three kids in the middle of a global pandemic, like it sounds like a pretty relaxing life. But that's not to say there weren't hardships. In 2010, his beloved mother, Donna, was fighting both breast and colon cancer. Wow. That two yeah. types of cancer. Yeah. And I think it was stage three. And yeah, those are obviously two incredibly deadly types of cancer too. So I can't imagine the stress and the fear that the entire family must have been going through. I mean, you had testicular cancer a few years back. And though that was a very short process, it was still one of the worst periods of our life. Yeah. Anytime you hear the big C from your doctor. I mean, it, it's it's devastating. Uh, even if it's a relatively easy treatment, quote unquote easy. Yeah. Um, you know, it still is cancer. And, you know, it takes at least three years of your life uh, before you're considered cancer free. Mm-hmm. If all of the screenings come back clear and that's after treatment. So, you know, it's a big deal and it affects not just you, but your entire family. And I can't imagine having two diagnoses of cancer. Right. And, you know, by this time, by 2010, Donna had already been dealing with this for five years. 
So I can't imagine having something hanging over my head like that for that long. But yeah. that's where this family was at the time. So I can only imagine that the entire Donahue family probably thought, all right, this is it. Like, this is the bad thing that's going to happen to them. You know, Donna's dual cancer diagnosis is the horrible thing that they're going to have to get through. But as they would soon find out, it wasn't the only thing, nor was it even close to being the worst. On March 10th, 2010, Shane Donahue was having a good day. He had done some um, ceiling tile work for Colgan Air and had just been paid $5,000 in cash. Nice. Yeah. His buddy, Timothy Hickerson, helped him with the job, so Shane gave him $1,000 out of that. Shane and Timothy stopped by his parents' house like he often did, and they were just hanging out when, according to his mother, he suddenly said, Mom, I've got to go. He told his mother that he loved her, and he and Timothy left the house at around 3.40 p.m. Timothy's family is well-known in Noakesville. His family owns Hickerson Brothers Electric Service, and his father at the time was the chief at the local volunteer fire department. Shane was apparently a pretty bad driver and racked up like a ton of tickets and other violations. So he wasn't driving at this time. Shane wasn't. Yeah, Shane wasn't. Okay, so the, the, yeah. What had his license been suspended? Is that why he they, wasn't they driving? They don't specifically say, but yeah, it sounds like it was something can, like that. Or something he got like, like kicked off of his insurance or whatever. It's but yeah, that's basically it. So on this day when he was over at his parents' house with Timothy, they you know, Timothy was driving and so they both left in one of the Hickerson brothers box trucks. Does the box truck have their family's business name on it? Yeah. On the side? Mm -hmm. Okay. I had no sense of where he was going, Donna later told the Washington Examiner. Quote, there was absolutely nothing. And this was unusual for Shane, but like, you know, it wasn't overly alarming. He is 23 years old. He doesn't have to tell his parents everywhere that he's going and what he's doing. Right. Did, did you say that he... Did he get a, a text or something? Did, did she say anything about... It? No, she didn't say anything about what precipitated their Him leaving. Just, uh, yeah, up, just up he just leaving. said that, yeah, mom, I gotta go. Okay. And this was the same day that they got paid in cash? Yeah. Okay. So pres presumably they have the cash on them. Right, presumably they do. And so, and that's the other thing, like, you know, he had $4,000 burning a hole in his pocket. Yeah. Um, so it's not crazy to assume that he just wanted to do something other than hang out at his parents' house that day. You know, right. he was with his buddy and they probably wanted to go out. Yeah. But Shane didn't come back for dinner like he normally did. And by the next day when they still hadn't heard from him, they knew something was wrong. Shane, if you couldn't figure this out already, was extremely close to his parents and he called his mother every single day. But when she didn't get her normal call on March 11th, they went to Shane's house. He wasn't there, but the TV was on, as were the lights. I mean, it just looked like Shane had stepped out, not that he was planning on being gone for a long time or anything like that. Now, of course, his parents have been trying to call him during this period, but their calls just went straight to voicemail. Shane had two cell phones, and they would later find out that both of them were turned off at approximately 4 p.m. on March 10th, just 15 to 20 minutes after his parents last saw him. That's strange. Yeah, and so that's that's why, and that, of course, comes out later in the police investigation. They obviously don't know this at the time. Right. That's why they think that, you know, the phones were manually shut off as opposed to them just dying, because what are the odds that two phones are going to die at the exact same time? Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you have two phones that you carry with you <laughs> for work. All the time. Yeah, and, like, they've never died at the same time. No. No, right. Yeah. 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 The Donahues reported Shane missing, and Prince William County Police started an investigation. In the early days and weeks, they searched Shane's duplex and used luminol and other technology to look for blood or DNA or you know any sign that something had happened in Shane's house. But they came up empty-handed. They also, of course, interviewed Timothy Hickerson, but they didn't get very far. And you know the details of this. Like what Timothy said or what he didn't say or any of that um, has never been made public. Mm. But he didn't give any helpful information to the police, basically. This is where the case kind of starts to tear the town apart. 
Because there's so few known facts about this case, a desperate and grieving family has clung to what little they do know. And what they know is this. The last time they saw Shane Donahue, he was climbing into the passenger side of Timothy Hickerson's truck. And like I said before, his phones were turned off 10 minutes later, maybe 15, and nothing was missing from his home that would indicate that he either A, met with foul play there, or B, took off and decided to start a new life. And it's also important to, to you know, know that, yes, he did have that cash on him, mm-hmm. but after his disappearance, like, none of his accounts were ever used, you know? I mean, there were no financial anything that happened. Where did they find his phones? They didn't find his phones. So they just were able to tell from the phone company. When they were turned off. Right. And they were never turned back on. I know you said that none of Tim's statements have been made public. Right. So like the police haven't even given a timeline or anything as far as as Tim is concerned. We just know that he left with Tim at, you said, 340? Yeah, around 345, somewhere around there. And and that's the thing. Like, that's what's so irritating and, and enraging about this case is that everything I found online, every news source that I found online has the same basic information, which is really just this, that, you know, that um, Timothy and Shane were together, that Shane just got paid, that he gave Timothy $1,000. He had $4,000. They were at his parents' house. They left his parents' house phone was turned off and that is it like there's never been anything like okay and then timothy was here timothy was there nothing they've never um released additional names of people that they've interviewed the only i i mean i've read about names of different people that they've interviewed but that's just been from social media posts um from like the family and other people involved in the case there's just been so little media coverage on this, which is, you know, makes it hard to do a, an episode about this, but it's also why I wanted to do it. Right. Because, you know, how are people supposed to know if they have information that's important if they don't have more details of the case? Right. I mean, yes, everybody knows that if they saw Shane after 345 on March 10th, 2010, that they should probably come forward. Exactly. But that's not the only information that can help break a case like this. You know, if they saw Timothy at 5 p.m., maybe that's relevant. If they saw him at 4.15 p.m., that's definitely relevant. If they saw where his work van was going exactly yeah any of that you know you're right and and bringing up the timeline is important because we don't have one the donna he's quickly believed that something terrible has happened to shane and this is 2010 so they did what anyone would do they took to the internet on april 10th 2010 someone made a very straightforward post in a popular local message board fairfax underground it read quote does anyone know what happened to him from the facebook page Friends and family in all of Northern Virginia, this group has been created to spread the word for the search of Shane Donahue, last seen on Monday, March 22nd, 2010. Age 23, height 6'3", weight 185, eyes brown. He was last seen Monday, March 2nd, 2010. Supposedly, he was dropped off at his house. For any tips or leads, please contact 866-411-8477. So, you know, pretty simple, right? Like. The thread was called, I believe, Help Find Shane Donahue, and they basically copied and pasted from the Facebook group that was created. This is a pretty small area. Like, yes, we have people around here go missing pretty frequently, but like missing persons all over the country, the vast majority of them are, you know, are found. They're, they show up safely. Somewhere. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And usually pretty quickly. So to have a real honest-to-goodness missing person in Noakesville was quite rare. You know, so it makes sense that somebody would start a thread on this. But the common thread quickly devolved. The first several posts are what you would expect and hope to see. People expressing shock and well wishes for the family with a few theories thrown in. But on October 1st, someone makes an absolutely horrible post. It's honestly so bad that I don't even want to read the entire thing. Because it's not helpful. 
Um, it just starts, quote, I killed the piece of shit and buried him in a shallow grave just outside of Sterling, end quote. Yeah, if you can believe it, it gets like that's the nice part of the comment. Like it gets worse from there. It quickly becomes clear that this isn't some sort of confession. It's just a horrible person trying to hurt an already grieving family. What follows is just pages of posts with accusations being thrown around about Shane, about Timothy, and members of the Donahue and Hickerson families, in addition to just a ton of racist, sexist, homophobic garbage that serves absolutely no purpose other than causing pain. Just a side note before we get into deconstructing this whole mess, I'm sure you're not familiar with Fairfax Underground as you're barely familiar familiar with the internet in general. That's true. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> yeah. So this is an old school message board that ends up in the news periodically, basically for ruining people's lives. Great. Yeah. I don't know if you remember hearing the story of Nicole Mittendorf. No. She was a Fairfax County firefighter who went missing in 2016 and was later found to have died by suicide. I have a vague memory of that. Yeah. No. Well, as details of her disappearance and death came out, it was also revealed that she was not only a victim of sexual harassment at the firehouse where she worked, but several of the firefighters she worked with and other people took the harassment to Fairfax Underground. They used the site as basically an online burn book directed at this one woman. They spread all sorts of rumors about her, many of which were reported on, with some stories speculating as to whether or not this online bullying actually led to her death. That's terrible. Yeah. And so this site is, like I said, it pops up periodically because it's just a disaster. And so that's why I'm going to leave some of the more inflammatory accusations out of this story, because it's pretty clear that a lot of what has been posted on that site is just honestly bullshit. With that said, some of the people who posted are directly involved in the case. And if you read between the lines, there is some actual information there. Okay. Let's start off with some of what was being said about Shane. Based on the posts from both sides of the argument, as well as news stories, in all likelihood, installing ceiling tiles and performing other odd jobs wasn't Shane's only source of income. He was probably a low-level drug dealer. Hmm. He has two convictions for possession of marijuana, dating from 2006 and 2009. But aside from all the traffic issues, um, those are the only two blights on his record. He was never arrested for dealing or anything like that. If Shane was dealing, he almost certainly wasn't big time. Two years before his disappearance, his roommate actually got arrested by the FBI for distributing narcotics. And I have to believe that the FBI was watching this roommate for a while prior to his arrest. And, you know, since Shane wasn't caught up in any of this, he wasn't arrested. Like, I have to, it, I have to think that he couldn't be that big of a dealer. I'm kind of curious as to how the roommate got arrested or where, I should say. Uh, I know this has nothing to do with the story, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, if if he was arrested at the house, right. there's a certain amount of constructive possession, depending on where they found the narcotics, um, that Shane could be implicated in as well. But if he was arrested someplace else, then who knows? So you think that... Maybe he was arrested someplace else, and that's why Shane wasn't caught up in this? Yeah. Yeah, either that or or if it was at the house, the narcotics were in only the roommate's room. But yeah. even, even then, there's a certain amount that Shane probably would have been investigated. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it doesn't sound like he was ever investigated or, you know, really involved in it in any way other than the fact that, you know, he, he lost a roommate. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> you know my thing about drugs. I am like the only person in the world that D.A.R.E. totally worked on. (laughs) I won the D.A.R.E. poster contest in fifth grade, and I was absolutely convinced that if I did something like try cocaine once, I would immediately die. And right before I moved to New York City when I was 24 or whatever, I did some research into neighborhoods. And my main takeaway from all of the safety recommendations was that most of the crime that happens is somehow related to drugs. So if you stay away from drugs, you won't have a problem. And like, let me tell you, I spent four years living in that city in sketchy neighborhoods. 
And aside from the teenager who tried to steal my iPod when I was coming off the subway in Brooklyn, that article was correct. (laughs) But I bring it up because the basic tenant of that article, you know, is true. If you are involved with drugs, even at a low level, your likelihood of being a crime victim does go up. Sure. So immediately, many people both on that forum and in real life speculated that Sheen's disappearance was somehow drug-related. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's reasonable. I mean, if you're looking at victimology, right, like you've got to look at the factors in their lives that make something more likely to happen to him. Right. And there is definitely credence to this theory, too, because just two days before his disappearance— Sheen's home was broken into by what news reports called acquaintances. Mm. The burglars were allegedly looking for cash and stole medications. Mm. A post in Fairfax Underground does name names, and one of the names is Timothy Hickerson. And it's interesting to know that this does actually seem to be agreed upon information, as no one from either side really challenged the accusation. But if that's true, do you think Shane would have brought Tim onto that job with him? Well, that's the thing. I think that Tim was already on that job with him. Because, I mean, if, if you know, this happened on March 20th, Shane went missing on March 22nd. They got paid on March 20 or on March 22nd. You know, if oh, they're so making $5,000, they it's not a two-day job. Like, I'm thinking that this job had probably gone on for a week or so. Right. Yeah, so whatever happened between the two, whether or not – Timothy did break into Shane's house. Everything, you know, was obviously fine between them on March 22nd. Right, was, especially for Shane to willingly get into his work van and... And bring him to his parents' house. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But based on the break-in and the fact that Timothy was the last known person to see Shane, the Donnie, he's made it abundantly clear that they believe that he, at very least, has knowledge about what happened to their son. While police did interview Timothy as well as other people with connections to Shane, they just hit dead ends. Nobody was talking. But what's interesting to me is that despite the fact that Shane was last seen in that Hickerson brother's box truck, according to the Donahues, it was never searched. Hmm. So police went to Shane's place and, you know... Did an extensive search to rule out any foul play there. Exactly, but apparently didn't search the truck in which he was last seen. Right, but we also don't have the statements from anybody that the police interviewed. So perhaps Mm -hmm. they interviewed Tim, who said he dropped him off at home, and perhaps there was a corroborating witness to that. Right. Therefore ruling out the work van. Yeah. Just the theory. No, you're right, and that's, again— Going back to the frustrating part, like, we don't know. And I think the lack of knowledge of basic facts of the case have led to years of rumors and, you know, people accusing other people of slander. And, you know, it's it's gotten really ugly. Socially, things involved with the case are spiraling out of control. Yeah. So whether or not, you know, they searched the box truck or had a valid reason not to search the box truck, police were looking for Shane. In the weeks after his disappearance, they did extensive local searches with cadaver dogs in nearby woods and streams, etc. But no one ever came up with a trace of him. As time went on and nothing seemed to be happening in Shane's case, the Donahue family became frustrated. They started to believe that the Hickersons, being such a prominent family in the community, was the reason why police seemed to be taking almost a hands-off approach to Shane's disappearance. So while I can certainly understand the thought process behind that, Mm -hmm. um, this is not a small-town police department doing this investigation. Prince William County is huge. That is true. And that's important to point out. While Noakesville is a small town, Mm -hmm. Prince William County... Police is a huge police department. Yeah. So. And they're used to dealing with crime, right? Like oh, not yeah. necessarily. Maybe not disappearances. This, they might but, not be experts at disappearing right. or missing persons, but I'm sure that they have investigated missing persons before. Yeah. So. We're not talking Mayberry over here. Exactly. Yeah. That's important to point out, mm-hmm. especially considering that while the Hickerson family might be prominent in Noakesville, Prince William County and Prince William P- County Police is much 
larger yeah. than Noakesville. And that is a good point because, I mean, a lot of the perspective is, again, coming out of Noakesville being a small town and the fact that Timothy's father is the fire chief. Right. You know. So and, I'm sure that there are definitely some connections there sure. between the family and, and law, enforcement. law enforcement. But again, I understand the thought process. Um, especially when you're left with no answers. No answers, right. Uh, you know, it just sends your mind spinning in all kinds of different directions. But it's 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 important to note that the, the local police are not tiny. Right. Well, and for their part, Timothy Hickerson's family and friends accused the Donahues of harassment. They said that Timothy had been cleared by police, but the Donahues wouldn't let it go. And apparently, Timothy's supporters tore down a bunch of missing persons flyers um, that Shane's friends and family had posted up around town. The flyers featured a photo of a Hickerson brother's truck. And the Donahue's argument was that this is totally reasonable because that's the last place Shane was seen. And the Hickerson's argument is that their name was being dragged through the mud with no evidence. Yeah, this is a, this is a tough situation for for either side i can see both right perspectives yeah exactly yeah you know i mean the hickerson family obviously doesn't think that they're that that timothy had anything to do with it so they're just seeing you know his name constantly being brought up in this right. he's being accused like it's all over the internet it's all over this fairfax underground site it's all over facebook yeah you know but at the same time then, the Donahues think that sh- that Timothy did something to Shane, and because and, they have nowhere else to right. go, they, there's there's the the investigation isn't leading anywhere else, exactly. or at least not not based on what they know. Yeah, and so from their perspective, like this guy is just getting away with it and living his life, and it's driving them crazy. Right. But despite the many people who were coming to Timothy's defense, it turns out he wasn't exactly innocent. Just a few months after Shane's disappearance, Timothy Hickerson was arrested, but not for anything having to do with this case. On May 30th, 2010, employees at the Virginia Arms Company, a gun store in Manassas, were staying overnight in the shop. There had been an attempted burglary the night before, so they wanted to stick around and make sure it didn't happen again. But it did happen again. But this wasn't exactly an Ocean's Eleven type heist. Around 10 p.m., employees heard somebody trying to pry open the back door, so they went back there and confronted the would-be robber. He immediately ran to his car but couldn't get it unlocked, so he gave up and ran into the woods. Leaving evidence of who he was, though. Like his whole car. Wow. The gun store employees called the police, who quickly found Timothy Hickerson hiding in the woods. He was arrested, and detectives told reporters that they were able to link him to several other area burglaries. In December of 2010, Hickerson was sentenced to four years in federal prison for these robberies. The Donahues showed up to Hickerson's hearings and allegedly tried to speak to the prosecution to let them know that they believe he's involved in their son's disappearance. From their perspective, I'm sure, you know, it was advocacy, but from the Hickerson's perspective, it was just more harassment. Yeah, I mean, there's there's no evidence, right? And point. and this case has nothing to do with Shane's disappearance whatsoever. And you know, the Donahues showed up in like their fine Shane T-shirts, and and we're trying to get them to really go after Timothy. Yeah, and the a prosecutor on another case, like that's not the correct avenue to yeah advocate that. Hickerson going to prison may have reaffirmed the Donahue's belief that he's not a good person, but it didn't provide closure. After Shane didn't come home, his parents knew in their hearts that he was dead. They even bought a burial plot for him. Bubba would never leave me like this, Donna Donahue told reporters. While they didn't hold out hope that they would find their son alive, they certainly didn't give up on finding answers. About a year or so after his disappearance, Donna erected a huge banner on her property facing the road. It had a picture of Shane and said, We miss Shane, missing for blank days. And Donna would change the number every single day to reflect how many days she'd been without her son. That's incredibly sad. Mm -hmm. To further show her dissatisfaction with how Prince William County Police had handled his case, 
she attached a banner underneath that said, don't let your child go missing in PWC. As the years passed and the numbers moved from the hundreds to the thousands on the banner, no new information surfaced. Four years after Shane was last seen, police received a tip that led them to search the septic tank at the property he was renting, but nothing was found. There were a few other possible conclusions to this story, including an unidentified body found in a wooded area in Noakesville in 2018, but that body proved to be that of a local missing teenager. Internet sleuths have also tried to match unidentified John Doe's to Shane, but with no luck. Years without answers wouldn't prove to be the last tragedy that would strike the Donahue family. Shane's younger sister, Cheyenne, was deeply affected by her brother's disappearance. She can be seen all over the Facebook group, constantly posting about Shane. She also dreamed of being a doctor and graduated high school a year early. She then received a bachelor's degree of science and chemistry from Virginia Commonwealth University. Her passion became educating people about substance abuse, and she received a degree in substance abuse counseling. But the tragedy of never knowing what happened to her brother began to wear on Cheyenne, and eventually it all became too much for her. Just last year, on June 13th, 2019, Cheyenne died by suicide. She was 28 years old. That's terrible. Yeah. I mean, just tragedy after tragedy with this family. Cancer diagnosis missing missing child now suicide Mm -hmm. it's awful yeah i can't imagine and that really when i found that out you know i was already i had already decided that we would do this case this week and of course this came up in my research and it really made me want to get this story out there even more because of course every family deserves answers but dear god this family deserves answers yeah Her parents published a long, heartfelt obituary that read in part, quote, She could no longer deal with the heartache and pain that overwhelmed her and the depression she suffered. She's now reunited and at peace with Shane in heaven, and that is the thing that gives her family the most comfort. Survivors include her loving parents, Brian and Donna Donahue, brother Sean Donahue, as well as extended family and friends. She was preceded in death by her loving brother and best friend, Shane Donahue. I wanted to tell Shane's story this week for a few reasons. Like I said, this family needs answers. It's local. But beyond that, I think the stigma of the possible drug connection has made this not get the media coverage that it deserved. It's horrible that the most I have found written on this case were pages of vitriol spewed on anonymous internet forums. Shane Donahue was loved. He is still deeply loved. And his family deserves answers just as much as the family of a more media-perfect victim. Somebody talking is the only way that this is going to get solved at this point. I mean, unless they find a body, but that doesn't necessarily solve it. It'll give us more information. I'm just curious as to why Prince William County haven't released some sort of timeline on the investigation. I mean, maybe they don't have one. Maybe they don't have a solid lead on anything. Yeah. But I mean, I I of course wouldn't expect them to release everything leads or anything like that, but 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 maybe some sort of basic timeline as far as what they know. Yeah. And even recently they posted about this case on their Facebook page because they they like highlight cold cases every now and again. But, I mean, even that post was just basically the information that we already know, you know, when he went missing and from where. But there's just nothing else that anybody has written about it. And I haven't seen, you know, there are a couple of stories um, about the banner and things like that. Um, But nothing has been written about this. I haven't seen anything in years. And even... Even Cheyenne's death, I found out about from the forum, and so I did a little digging, and I found the obituary, but I didn't see a single news article written about that. Why? Why wouldn't that? Why wouldn't that be out there? Yeah, it's. I don't know. I mean, it's it's incredibly frustrating, and you know, for every case that we see that does have a lot of media coverage, there are so many that don't, and. These people deserve to be talked about. Their stories deserve to be told. It doesn't matter 
the background of the person that goes missing. Right. You know, nobody's life is a throwaway. Every, no. Everybody is somebody's son, daughter, father, brother, sister. You know, there, there's connections, friend even. Everybody has connections in their lives. Yeah. And nobody's life deserves to just be tossed aside and forgotten about. And these are real people. And they're real people that have to deal with this every single day. And that's why I was so angry reading all of these posts because I cannot tell you how disgusting they were to write something like that. Like regardless of how you feel about, you know, the missing person or the family or whatever. I mean, to say the things that they said, like, you know, I'm glad he's dead and I like hope he's rotting in hell. Like, you know, it's beyond the pale. That's despicable. Yeah. Yeah. And there's this whole other weird side story rabbit hole that I went down that has to do with a stupid Fairfax Underground page. One of the names um, of the people who has been mentioned as being possibly involved. So somebody accused this person of helping Timothy bury the body basically. And, you know, I don't really don't want to get into the guy's name because again, this is just like all internet forum rumor and right. whatever. Yeah. Um, so that guy though was later killed by police in an unrelated incident in North Carolina. And his son, who was a, te- who is a teenager, he's 19 now, he was like 14 at the time was very active on this site on Fairfax underground And was one of the people who would, you know, say terrible things to other people and, you know, was basically a troll. But then he got it dished back to him as well and ended up. His father was killed. Yeah. And ended up running away from home. And then there were news stories about like, hey, did, you know, this online bullying like lead to this kid's disappearance? And now this kid was found like he was found in New New Jersey not too long after and he was fine. He did leave, on you know, of his own accord and, and whatever. But it's just this case has so many weird connections and layers. And with the amount of people talking I have to believe that there are people who are talking and saying things that are real. It's it is probably buried somewhere in that uh cancer of a site. Yeah. And whether or not it is though, I mean, it is buried with those people. There are people who I fully believe know important information about this case and they're not talking to police. Somebody needs to say something. This case reminds me of the Bear Diaz case. In both, the victim was a young man with cash who seemed to be hanging around the wrong people. In this case, just as that one, we need someone who knows something to finally have the courage to give the Donahue family the answers they need and deserve. Shane Ryan Donahue has been missing since March 22nd, 2010. He was 23 years old at the time. He would be 34 today. If you have any information on what happened to Shane that day or where he may be now, you can call the Prince William County Police Department at 763-792-7279. If you'd like to leave an anonymous tip, you can call 866 866- 411-8477. You can see all of the sources for this episode along with photos on our website and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five star review on Apple podcast. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. We'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. 
Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you can do it!